execution of 2015 just happened in the U.S. The man who was executed was named Andrew Brannon, and he died by lethal injection at the Georgia Diagnostic and Classification Prison in Jackson on January 13th. A sad addition to this already sad tale is that 66-year-old Brannon was diagnosed with severe mental illness well before he killed a sheriff. But the saddest part is that Brannon was a Vietnam veteran who suffered from PTSD. In 1968, Brannon volunteered for the Army, and he trained as a parachutist. He served in Vietnam from 1970 to 1971, and during that time, he saw a lot of bad stuff go down. He saw his friends and his commanding officers die, and narrowly escaped death himself on several occasions. He was honorably discharged in 1971. He received the Bronze Star and two commendation medals, and he returned to his life all kinds of freaked out. His marriage and his job fell apart. In 1984, he was granted partial disability for his service-connected PTSD. By 1991, he was deemed 100% disabled by the Department of Veterans Affairs due to his PTSD, meaning that he was completely and utterly unable to function in society. He was further diagnosed as bipolar by a VA psychiatrist in 1996. By 1998, he was living in a shack he had built in the woods with no running water or electricity. And that's the year in which he was pulled over by Deputy Sheriff Kyle Dinkheller at a traffic stop. Brandon had been driving 98 miles an hour in his pickup truck. At first, he exchanged pleasantries with Dinkheller, but then something snapped. Brannon started dancing around in a really disturbing way, flailing his arms, singing, shoot me, shoot me at the officer. Then Brannon goes back to his truck, gets out a shotgun, and starts an all-out firefight. He shoots Dinkeller nine times, killing him. He was later convicted of murder and sentenced to death. The fact that Sheriff Dinkeller lost his life in this terrible way is so sad. And executing a man who lost his mind in a war he was sold by his country? That's not justice for Dinkheller. That's not justice for Brannon. That's just straight up no justice for all. Tonight, let's talk about that. Ken Burns' film, The War, shows us the invisible scars of combat. It's why some vets never really came home again. In World War II, they called it shell shock. As you could tell when I walked in, my right hand wasn't functioning right. It also affects hundreds of thousands of veterans from Vietnam and Iraq. I, I've been out of country 20 odd years. I still shake my boots off. And I still see blood on my boots every day. He had this, this look in his eyes. It looked at it. Once you see, you will never forget it. I really scared a lot of people um, and did a lot of things I should not have done. Post-traumatic stress the causes, the symptoms, and the latest on treatment. There's unfortunately a running joke that if you don't have PTSD, by the time you get to the VA, you'll have it by the time you leave. Too often, strange behavior on the home front was blamed not on the horrific experiences in places like Peleliu, Anzio, or Normandy, but on individual weakness. And the psychiatrist at that time, you know, was the dominant way of doing things, was lie down on the couch, tell me about your mother. Now there's a new urgency to develop more effective treatments because of the wave of veterans returning from Iraq and Afghanistan. There are no hard numbers yet on how many might be affected of the one and a half million who've served, but in a New England Journal of Medicine study, one in six Iraq veterans suffered from major depression, generalized anxiety, or PTSD. And the journal says many more veterans will suffer symptoms in the years to come. I could not stand being here anymore. I couldn't stand being in America with, you know, just living my life the way everybody else does. Michael Zakia, a highly decorated Marine, was diagnosed with PTSD after a harrowing tour in Iraq in 2004. A lieutenant colonel, he trained in Iraqi Army Battalion and was part of the most intense urban combat for the U.S. military in a generation, the Battle of Fallujah. You know, fighting street to street, house to house, uh, you know, going into houses, finding you know, people dead and you know, mutilated, um, bodies in the streets. During a firefight, an insurgent fired a rocket-propelled grenade. 
somebody said, uh, is anybody hit? And uh, when I moved off the wall, there was a big bloody imprint uh, from my body. And uh, I said, I, I'm, I'm hit. A piece of shrapnel had gone through Zakia's shoulder, but he kept on fighting. Six weeks later, the Marines and the Iraqis had secured the city. But it was a time when kidnappings and beheadings of coalition personnel were all over the news. And soon Zakia got word that the insurgents were personally targeting him for assassination. Basically the message was, you know, Zakia is going to die like the other infidels. Vindication. That's what the father of Kenneth Ellis III shot and killed by Albuquerque police and upon hearing these words from the Department of Justice. We found that officers used deadly force against people who did not pose an immediate threat of death or serious harm to the officers or to others and against people who posed a threat only to themselves. Ellis was gunned down while pointing a gun at his own head. He had been an Iraq war veteran suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder. Ellis Sr. says it's been his mission to fight for police reform since his son's death. The federal investigation began in 2012, but it was this video released this March that brought public anger to a boiling point. James Boyd was homeless and mentally ill. Officers killed him at point-blank range. He was holding knives. The video spurred protests on Albuquerque streets, including this 12-hour demonstration two weeks ago that prompted police to respond with tear gas and riot gear. 43-year-old veteran Dan Rochelle was just arrested for threatening to kill President Obama. He was deployed to Iraq and served for 16 years. He came home, was diagnosed with PTSD and depression, and started to work at a vet center in Montana. There, other vets started to see he was losing it. He carried a gun to work and started telling people that he'd kill the president if he ever came to town. He even trained his wife at a rifle range to help with the assassination. The Secret Service came and arrested him. Now that he's been removed, the center says they can get back to their mission of caring for vets. But Dan is one of those vets, and the center couldn't help him. No one could. We're continuing to make major investments. The days when depression and PTSD were stigmatized, those days must end. and everyone that came to hear this hearing, I think it's very important. I um, <clears throat> I first got uh, uh, evac out of Iraq um, 
after my second tour with PTSD. And uh, and they, they put me on medications. And a week after that, I got discharged from the inpatient uh, facility. They just gave me medications and uh, sh put me back with the uh, rear rear detachment unit. And uh, I got in a I got in a bad car accident. Um, degloved my left hand and uh, brain injury. And uh, then uh, from the very start, when I woke up um, in the German hospital. They were really good to me, but right when I got to launch stool, the the doc the doctor started telling me that I was in trouble, that I was doing something wrong. You know that something happened, that I did something wrong, and then uh, it just kept on going. They wouldn't tell me. They wouldn't tell me what was up. So my stress, I'm I'm thinking I don't know I don't know what's going on. I just woke up from my accident and I'm totally messed up. Anyways. Sooner or later, the, the doctors kept up that type of uh, treatment toward me. And I think it was because I wasn't wounded in Iraq, just in Germany. So when I got to Walter Reed, the same type of treatment continued. It felt like I was a second rate. Like you know, I told them I was like, look, I've served, uh, I've served two times in Iraq. I got, I got sent back for PTSD. You know, I'm having hard times. You know, and they didn't listen to a word I said, all they said was, you know, no, you're in trouble, you did something wrong, you're going back, you know, so. To a standoff with an Army veteran and leaving an Army, Army veteran dead. Pierce County Sheriff's deputy shot and killed 25-year-old Brian McLeod. It's a tragedy. Joe Norton, Brian's father-in-law, blames what happened on the Army veteran's PTSD. After a tour in Afghanistan two years ago, Brian was noticeably different. Family members say Brian had friends that lost arms and legs. They need a lot of help and they don't get it. The good that could probably come out of it is that these services would be made more available. Because lives are shattering too often. Now a few weeks ago we first brought you the case of the shooting of a former two-tour Marine, Jose Garena. A SWAT team in Pima County, Arizona, had targeted, targeted his home as part of a series of drug raids. But before Garena could answer the door, the door was broken in by SWAT. And they saw Garena was holding a rifle and they proceeded to open fire. He was shot dead in his home after a SWAT team unloaded over 70 times, leaving him dead with 60 bullets to the chest. And here's a helmet camera from the actual incident. I'll warn you that what you are about to see is graphic. We should note that after he was shot, his wife begged for treatment. Medical professionals weren't allowed into the house for over an hour. Now, as for the drug raid, no actual narcotics were found in his home, and his rifle still had the safety engaged. Now, after an investigation was launched into the details of this botched raid, it turns out that the SWAT team was cleared of any wrongdoing by the state attorney's office. Surprised? We were too. But the attorney representing that SWAT team feels that they made the right decision. This is um, no no surprise to me. I fully expected this. It's the uh, correct result. In their effort, it's the correct result. Clearing the SWAT team who unloaded 70 gunshots onto one man was the right decision to make. What about all the evidence? What about the fact that Garena couldn't have fired on the SWAT team because he had the rifle safety on? What about the fact that there were no drugs found in that home? Apparently, none of that really matters. And sure uh, enough. Excuse me? Who shot him? I, I don't know. I don't know. It's just a police outside. I had my clothes open, but I had my things in the room. And I don't... And he Where is your husband at right now? He's on the floor. He's inside the house? Yes, he's on the floor. He's... He's... Can you please hurry up? Well, Mama told me When I was young She'd sit beside me my only son